Welcome to another episode of Eric Wait Whiskey Studies, and this is has been a really fantastic week. Uh, this has been Balcona's week within my Texas Whiskey uh, Marathon. Uh, last year, I had uh, Jaron Hempstead, the uh, head distiller, on from Balcona's. We had a fantastic time uh, getting to know uh, the brand a little bit better. And this time, I've got someone from behind the scenes, someone you may not know, uh, unless you're really, really, really familiar with uh, Balcona's, which is the uh, manager for the Stillhouse, Gabe Richard. All righty. So, uh, Gabe, why don't you say hello to everyone uh, watching it on the repeat or in the chat? Hey there, y'all. How you doing? First, thing I want to say I want to compliment you on your beard. That's Thanks. <laughs> All righty. So, this is a very, very geeky channel. I like to go as deep as uh, we can. Uh, but before you go on, I'm going to silence my stupid telephone because I didn't do it before. Good idea. I get people from Asia or whatever trying to sell me drink. What are you going to do? Buy it? <laughs> yeah. So we can go as geeky and deep as we want. I, I, I'm. It's a continuing learning process for me. Yeah. Um, regardless of how many certifications, degrees, whatever, and how many distilleries are, you know, I've been to, been to 40 of them over in Scotland. Um, Every distillery I go to, because everything's a little bit different, yeah. I learn something new, and it's always not just about uh, the spirit, but the people behind it, and get, get to know people um, who are producing the actual whiskey. So um, first, uh, let me find out a little bit about your background. How did you, you get into whiskey? Most people know I went from wine into whiskey because I was preparing for an exam. How did you get into whiskey? Uh, well... Um you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up drinking it, so I had to get into it somewhere. So yeah, I, uh, when, uh, when I was in graduate school, um, I studied, uh, geochemistry at the University of Kentucky, um, in Lexington, Kentucky. And there's four roses, wild turkey, buffalo trace, you know, uh, Woodford Reserve, you name it, you know, you can hit a dozen, uh, distilleries just by throwing a cat, you know? So when I was there studying, um, for my master's, I, I kind of started getting involved in whiskey. I was making no money. I mean, I was a, I was a graduate assistant, like teaching assistant. So I was making like a thousand dollars a month. So all the free tours of the distilleries in the area were like awesome for me and my cohort. Right. Cause every, every weekend we could hit up Frankfurt or, or wherever, um, and get a bunch of free booze cause we couldn't afford to buy it. Um, so yeah, we did that a lot and that kind of piqued my interest in it a little bit. And, um, I ended up going overseas to work in oil and gas for uh, a while. But you have um, a degree in petrology as well, right? So yeah, I have a I have a bachelor's in uh, geology and I have a master's in geology geochemistry. Okay. Um, yeah, I studied I studied um, uh, basically metamorphic petrology. It's just the rocks at high right. temperature and pressure. Um, the great the Greek name the Greek word is petros. From where did you get the name Peter from? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 for sure. Or petrified, like a petrified forest. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but anyways, yeah, I was, I was doing, you know, my thesis was not related to whiskey at all. I was in Greenland, like in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then kind of, you know, shoved in a basement in, at the University of Kentucky, uh, zapping rocks with lasers for uh, years. Um, and then I was kind of getting out of that and I'd been drinking a lot of whiskey and I'd been thinking like, man, it'd be really cool to, it'd be cool to make some of this and like participate in this growing craft scene. I had some interviews at some places. Um, unfortunately that they, they, the oil industry kind of beckoned and they gave me a really cushy job overseas. Um, so I took that and kind of took that opportunity and was in Spain for a while. But when I was getting out of oil and gas, kind of like the, it, it was kind of downturning and I was also just a little bit over it. Um, you know, the company I worked for was, they have 120,000 employees. I was nothing. I was the tiniest cog and the, one of the largest machines on the planet. So I was trying to get into something where I could kind of have a, you know, a little bit of creative say and kind of get my hands dirty in a different way and a more like fulfilling way. Um, yeah. And I started just, I was, I was living in Berlin. I threw out some information online, like, Hey, like I'm, a, I'm getting out of the oil and gas industry. I'm, uh, I've experienced in, in, in chemistry. I went to college. I went to, uh, got my master's at, in Kentucky and, uh, yeah, just like threw it up on the American distilling institutes online forum and a bunch of distilleries started contacting me. I had a ton of Skype interviews and then Balcones was the only one that stuck. 
Wow. So, you know, it, it's interesting because people come from the tech industry uh, and, you know, they're a sort of a computer geek or whatever. That's where they made their money, but they have this passion for wine or passion for whiskey. Yeah. So then they go into that or people come from all kinds of different kinds of backgrounds and somewhere along the way, they develop a passion for whiskey and what starts off perhaps as a hobby yeah. ends up being a vocation, even if it means working for less money, even if it means working harder, yeah. because they'd rather make less money and work harder for something they love than yeah. a good job, you know, flying a, a you know a keyboard, you know. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. That was that. I mean, that was definitely that was definitely a huge part of it. I mean, I took obviously I, I took a pay cut, um, but but it was I mean it was totally worth it. I was willing to go anywhere. I wanted to get my foot in the door. I wanted to throw bags of grain. I wanted to work the bottling line. I didn't care where it was or who it was with. I just wanted to get in and see what it was like and see if I, you know, t t took a liking to it and see if I had an act for it and if I could find a place in the industry. And very I was very fortunate to have the background that I did because I think I was like a little a little sexier <laughs> on my resume than I actually am in real life probably. I didn't know, I didn't know shit all about whiskey. I was distilling in my apartment in Spain on oh. like a little five-gallon uh, stovetop still. Right, right. From Portugal, and I was like making corn whiskey in my apartment in Spain. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I still have a few bottles of that. It's terrible, just awful. Um, but yeah, I had, you know, I think that interest in it being from uh, having spent a lot of time in Kentucky and having the science background kind of like was just enough to kind of squeeze me in at the right time. Um, so, yeah. you put, so you put out feelers uh, out there, out in the industry, you know, yeah. looking to see who's going to. Uh, you know, uh, nibble at the bait or whatever, or you're going to look attracted to. Yeah. So had you heard of uh, Texas whiskeys? Were you familiar with Balcones or how did, or was this something completely new to you? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I think Balcones attracts the kind of people who like dive deep into something. They're not just like, oh yeah, you know, like I'm, I don't know. I am a soccer player, but really they play twice a year with their brother-in-law. It's like, right. no, I run the local league or, you know, I like, I'm a ref at my kids' games. You know, like people who are really into these interests of theirs and have a passion for stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, well, how you got to Balcones, had you yeah. heard of it, you know, familiar with the Texas whiskey yeah. industry or was that sort of your first introduction to it? Exactly. When I was in Kentucky, I was drinking a lot of big stuff, but I had all I, right away. I was kind of like, okay, I can get Buffalo Trace, I can get Eagle Rare, I can get you know Four Roses, and there's all this stuff that I had access to. But but I was still already into like MB Roland and Old Pogue and some kind of like craft or very kind of out of the way lesser known uh, bourbon. And when I was leaving the country. Um, I was actually interviewing with some craft distilleries in upstate New York. I knew of Kings County Distillery because of some stuff in the New York Times. And I'd heard of Balcones um, because of their best in glass win in 2012. Okay. So, so when did you come over to Balcones then? Uh, I came over to them in 2016. Okay. So you've been there for about four, about four years. Or coming up at least. Awesome. Awesome. So it's kind of neat because, you know, you could go to an established brand that's been around for generations, and, that, and there's a coolness factor to that. Oh, you know, sure. The, you know, the beams, you know, the, you know, long term, uh, uh, many generations, and, and, and be part of that. Or something that's sort of on the, on the frontier, on the cusp of really venturing out and doing something new and just starting to really get some recognition. I mean, yeah, you know, very. I mean, six months ago, there was one Balcones bottle at a local, say, Total Wine and More. Yeah. Now I'm seeing four, and yeah. now I'm seeing the name pop up here and there. Yeah. And, and of course, I've been like a, a, an evangelist for the Texas whiskey industry as a whole. Yeah. Uh, and particularly, I lo I've been loving uh, Balcones. In fact, for those who are watching, I I've already reviewed. Uh, let's see, what am I drinking here? Oh, I'm drinking the Barharia. Yeah. Uh, absolutely spectacular. Uh, this is the uh, rum cast, which I picked up on my first. This is which I picked up on my first visit uh, so there in April 2019, and then th this one over here is the Hechicerios. Yep. And I, these are spectacular. Absolutely love them. But I'm I'm I finding I'm really loving this per area. Yeah, um, yeah. Great. I, 
it's just fantastic. Yeah, no, it's a yummy one. And we're huge fans of that. We're actually, um, I mean, I don't know if we're at the point where we get to that, this kind of, these kind of nuggets, but we're, we're planning on doing another release of that this year. So you said you did some home distilling, which apparently uh, didn't work out all that great. Yeah. So has your training or whatever, I'm kind of finding out what exactly, uh, if I get your title correctly, uh, storehouse cool. manager, what that is, what you do, what kind of training and education was all OJT, and what is it exactly that you do? Uh, at yeah. this uh, so I started as just a production assistant in the brew house, whatever they told me, um, you know, pulling samples uh, in the warehouse or helping on the bottling line. But most of the time I was in the brew house um, with our team in there, helping just do the cereal cooks and doing the, the, the mashes for our malt. Um, and yeah, that, that turned and, you know, very pretty quickly that turned into an evening job in the still house after about a year and then rotating to other jobs. But now as the still house manager, um, which we've never had before is we keep increasing in size. We add, new roles to, you know, to justify our scale. But as a still house manager, I manage and supervise our distillation staff. Um, not Jared, Jared, our head distiller, I do not manage or supervise. He manages, supervises the hell out of me. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's the Jedi master at the yeah, distillery. Very much so very much so. Um, yeah. But so I manage and supervise our distillation staff. I coordinate our blending team and kind of our blending operations and try to keep us on schedule, keep blends, churning out and I work with Jared and um, Johnson, one of our uh, distillers in the blending uh, on the blending team. And then I also kind of, I track blends, I number crunch, I manage our warehouse inventory. So I kind of forecast what we can make, what products mm -hmm. we can make based on what we have in the warehouse. And I just, I try to understand the warehouse so that other people don't have to. So how many people then have hands on, uh, on the stills and, and working in the still house? Uh, there is two, there's a morning guy and there's an evening guy and then there's myself. Okay. Okay. So having traveled around a little bit, I've been to 40 distilleries in Scotland, six in Kentucky, yeah. a dozen in, um, Texas. And I have two more, at least two more trips. I'm going back to Texas this year. Good. I'm hoping by the end of the year, I've been to every distillery on the Texas whiskey trail. Cool. That's, that's the goal. It's um, a, that, that's a big goal, man. Yeah. Yeah, the problem is everything, you know, Texas is a very big state. It's not like, it's not like Space Side where they're all kind of clumped in together. Yeah. But, uh, you know, some, I've heard people say, oh, every distillery tour is all basically the same. If you've been to one, you haven't been there. Nonsense. If you say that, then you aren't paying attention or you aren't very knowledgeable about production because mm -hmm. there are, a, it's like saying all rock and roll is the same or all rap is the same or all country music is the same. It's not. Yeah. Or all bourbons are the same. So, I mean, you look at, say, the McAllen stills. Uh, they're short and have that sort of sharp angle to them. Uh, you go to Glenmorangie, uh, which has, like, these giraffes, some of the tallest stills in Scotland, yeah. and a number of other variations in between of the shape of the stills. Some of the – one of the weirdest I've ever seen uh, is at uh, Pulteney. Apparently, they had a building – and they go, we got to get a still in there. Oh, shit, it's not going to fit. Fruit, cut it off, then stick the line arm off, off the side. Okay, fruit, now we can get it in there, you know. Yeah. But I got to say, the stills at Balcona's beats them all. Those are the weirdest looking stills I've yeah. ever seen. So talk to me a little bit about those stills, sure. why they are the way they are. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and we get this a lot. We're like, what the hell? <laughs> What's up with your stills? So yeah, we have our stills are made by Forsyth. They're the premier Scottish still manufacturer um, and they're pot stills. So in a sense, they're, they're, you know, just, they're, they're simple. It's just a copper vessel. Um, right. Then uh, we have a normal cone like anyone else would. Um, and then our line arm is where it gets a little weird. Um, the reason uh, that our line arm kind of comes off and forms this like helix, these like coils um, on both still sets, we have two still sets, so two spirit stills, two wash stills. And um, on spirit one, on, on our first spirit still in this building, it's 10 turns at six inch diameter, so six inch diameter pipe. And then on spirit two, which was our second still set we got in July of 2017, it's a eight inch diameter and four turns. Um, the reason we did that is because... You know, I mean, there, there's some lore around this and people kind of make a big uh, stink about it. You know, there's the story of like the 
the old Scottish distillery that wanted to replace their still, but like there was like a dent in the side and they insisted that that dent be put in on the new one that came in. So the exact same geometry was there. So in a way it's, you know, it's a little, it's a little superstitious, but for our purposes, when we were at 17th street in the machine shop under the bridge, we built a lot of our own equipment. Um, and the last set of stills that we have there, we built ourselves. So we have these stills on one side of the facility and then the line arms like follow the angle of the roof all the way up the facility to the condensers we built at the top of the wall. And um, when we moved into this facility, we wanted to mimic the same distance traveled and the same uh, incline so that the spirit would have as much same amount of copper contact and the same journey to travel. Um, and the only way to do that in this scale without running it into another building or buying a building on another block was to coil it like this. Right. Or add more floors to the top of the building. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it was gonna get it was gonna be ridiculous either way. And then um Richard Forsyth, this was his idea. He's like, okay, well, we'll just do a coil so you get the distance and the incline that it'll go in a circle instead of straight. And honestly, I mean that that has that has a really big uh effect on the on the product that we make. All of that um all that copper means that we have more reflux. We have more vapor contact with copper to strip and kind of clean and scrub the spirit. So it ends up being a little bit um, brighter and a little bit more aromatic rather than kind of like sulfury and heavy. So just to pause for a second, I always have to keep in mind, I mean, I know we're geeking out, we're nerds, and but just yeah, for right. walking. So what he's, so I always have to want to stop and explain things for some. So what he's talking about is um, if you have a shorter... And then a quick bent, say at McAllen, you don't have as much reflux because the spirit very quickly and very easily gets over the top and goes down yeah. versus a taller um, um, top of the still and then the, and the line arm. Yeah. It, has, it has a little bit more challenge getting up there and up and over. And so the result is, one, you have a lighter spirit. But if you create it such that more is dropping back down into – correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah then you're increasing the, the reflux. And so some stills, the Scottish stills, you see a like a bulb uh, yeah. off the side of it. And so they do that as well to create a little bit more reflux so it drops back down. Yeah. And so by doing the corkscrew, in a sense, yeah. Yeah. Um, then uh, you're getting more reflux. And so more is coming back down, so you get more uh, going through the distillation process. It, have I got that right? Yeah, yeah. So basically it's – we get – I mean, the byproduct of that, it's not a goal, but it's more efficient run. So we can actually take more alcohol out, but that's just a byproduct of us wanting that flavor profile. What it does is that um, we get the, the, the heads cut ends up being really light. Like if we ran the same distillate on Spirit 1 and Spirit 2, they have different, 2 has wider coils and fewer, so less reflux. And on 1, the, on Spirit 1 with the thin, the thin coil and a lot of them, um, or corkscrew. I like that. That's a good one. I'm going to use that. Um, because of that, uh, the vapor has a harder time escaping. So like the alcohol phase gets like enriched with alcohol and enriched right. with cogeners. Um, so yeah, we'll on spirit one, we'll cut our distillate at 82, 83% ABV for our heads cut. But on spirit two with less reflux, we never get above 78% ABV. Okay. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm gonna just one second. I'll be right back. Yeah. So essentially, what your still looks like, and the way I was describing it, yeah, is kind of like this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is, this is for pulling wine corks uh, yeah. out of out of wine bottles. So it essentially looks like this. And so another term we use is congeners or cogeners. Yeah. Uh, those are the flavor uh, compounds. Yeah. So again, just so we don't lose it, anybody, because some people are new. Some people have been around for a while. Sure. Um, so the effect then of the curling of the of the of the of the uh, coil or that yeah the line arm the line, the line arm yeah. the coils a whole nother thing um, sure. for bringing it down is you get lighter heads so you get you have the you have the heads you have the heart and then you have the tails yeah and so you're getting actually a lighter head yeah you, are you getting a, a a bigger cut from the from for the heart or yeah. how, how's that affecting getting a bigger cut for the hearts yeah the efficiency is bigger so it means because we get a higher heads cut we can kind of go a little deeper and balance it out with a slightly deeper tails cut so we get a deeper cut overall but yeah and like i said on the other still 
on spear two that doesn't have as much reflex, we wouldn't be able to cut as high, but it, it, it's always a balance. I mean, there's other, th there's other things in play because, because the one with more turns has more copper. It's, there's more fusils and it's dirtier from the tails cut of the day before. So it takes a little bit more to flush it out, but the ABV is higher because it's more rectified because there's more reflux. So it's this balance where in one, we're going to get it cleaner first, but the other one might be clean at about the same time and actually at a higher ABV so we can get like a brighter distillate out of it. It's all, it's all a game we're playing with each product of trying to get pairing it with the right still and um, yeah, kind of, teaming up that heads cut and that tails cut to give us like a really unique and the right profile for that product. So when did they make the move from the previous building to this one and then come up with this style? So yeah. what it's, what's, what's going through my head is I'm thinking, I'm putting myself in the place of uh, Balcon is making the move. And now you have this completely different still. Yeah. And okay, let's see what this thing does. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a journey. I mean, not to be like a little new agey, but it's really like we were at, at um, in 2016, in February 2016, we moved into our new building. But when we were when we were at 17th Street, we were working direct fire with homemade stills. And now we're in steam. Um, we have uh, everything's run on steam. Um, and in new stills made by a Scottish steel manufacturer with this giant coil, you know, so really it was just, I mean, it, 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 it's still taking time. We're still, you know, we're tasting stuff now and putting stuff into product now that we laid down two, three, four years ago, right. When we got to the building. So we're just learning like, okay, we really like this. We really like this four year old stuff. What was the tails cut on that? What was the heads cut on that? Who ran it? How hard did they run it? What was the parameter? Okay. We don't like this that just came online two years ago. Who distilled that? How did they do it? And it's me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's got to be pretty intensive, like note taking to every little detail. Yeah, uh, like a laboratory or something, so that later on you can see where the trajectory of sure. where this is going. You know. Yeah. No. No. It's it is. It's very complex. It's very complicated. And then when you throw into the, I mean, it, it's our job, and we have fun doing it. But when you throw into the mix that any given blend, or even we're talking about Brujeria and Echiceros. Both of those products had distillate made in both buildings. Oh. So some direct fire stuff in there. There's some new stuff on our new still set. So it's going to be like a lot of our stuff. We never, you know, we kind of run into, we get into trouble sometimes because, you know, the TTV wants to know what a recipe is for something. Like we, we you know, for Brujeria, for example, they want to know, okay, this is your, this is your whiskey finish and cherry casks. Well, is this the recipe? And we're like, no, this is just the expression. This is how we made it this time. It's got direct fire stuff from that other building, this building, it's got a variety of sherry, a variety of casts. Next time it'll be a little different, but we hope to capture the same profile and essence and expression. Right. And they're kind of like, no, <laughs> you know, they get, a, they get a little turned around with that. They mean, wait, you don't have a recipe? You're like, no. I mean, but, hey, we're artists. We're not making a product. We're making a craft. We're making an art. Recipes are boring. Yes, exactly, 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 exactly. So, so then it comes down to, in terms of getting the profile you want, then, and you mentioned you're also involved in blending, yeah. then blending has also got to be uh, important because it's not just, well, this is what came out of the still, we're kind of screwed, or, or, or it's great, and we hope we can duplicate it. It, yeah. it comes down to, you know, cast, and you said you're also involved in cast management, which yeah. is kind of neat because you're really you got your hands on in more than one key position there, uh, yeah. either hands on or, or oversight. Um, yeah. So then cast management and uh, blending, there's not a whole lot talked about um, about cast and cast management. Yeah. I, in the wine industry, um, they're kind of the unsung heroes because um, there's a lot more money that goes into not just how much a cast costs, yeah. but in order to maintain the cast. And there's a, they're very labor in intensive. And yet they don't get as much attention as the winemaker. And the same seems to go for uh, the whiskey industry. You know, when you do a tour, I find stills to be, uh, for me, they remind me of automobiles from the 1950s. Yeah. Oh, sure. You know, beautiful, round shaped, shiny, you know, uh, and just these big, massive arms of metal, you know, like the yeah. old car from the 1950s and even the muscle cars, 1960s. Um, but, um, and the calf, yeah, calf, Kind of all look the same. Yeah, okay. There's a road cast. But uh, managing the cast 
um, and, and keep a track of them and, and everything that's going into them and how they taste and so forth. And then this is where like ingredients, like if you're a chef, you know, you, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, to get to then get to the profile that you want as well. Yeah. No, so can... talk to me a little bit more about your hands on what you guys do. Perhaps maybe something that's a little bit different. Yeah. About, we're doing it with cast and blending and all that. Yeah, sure. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is ironic that we live, I mean, that in America, the distillers are kind of like esteemed and worshipped in a way. And in Europe, it is the complete opposite. They couldn't give two shits about the distillers. It's all about the it's all about the person who's blending and managing the inventory because they're in that's the other thing too with us, even Kentucky, relatively young inventory. Everyone gets real excited about a 25, 20, 18 year old bourbon. But like, you know, there are there are run-of-the-mill scotches that are 25, 30 years old. There are like meh cognacs that are 40, 50, 60 years old, you know? And so you have these people who have incredible responsibility managing it. It, 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 it always is ironic. I, when I visited France to go to Armagnac, oh. I, I was so surprised when I learned more about that, that, oh yeah, like these distilleries don't even have a, a still. They're, you know, these, these, these vineyards that are producing Armagnac, it's a traveling distiller. He has a still in the back of a pickup yeah. truck and he visits them three weeks out of the year when they need to distill. The rest of the time is cask management. Um, wow. yeah. so, so with us, we, I mean, we have a very diverse warehouse. We use three, uh, oak species predominantly, uh, virgin oak species. So we use, uh, French, European and American oak or Quercus Alba, Quercus Petraea, and then Quercus Petraea. Actually our European and French oak are the same oak species. There's a you don't use Rover? No, it's not Rover. Um, it's actually Petraea because it's from, yeah. it's from, um, our cooperage is wine catalog and okay. rover is not typically used for wine. It's used for spirits. Um, yeah. Petrae is used a little bit more uh, Eastern Europe. Yeah. Um, and, Romanian, yeah. and Romanian wines. Now people go, Eric is always bringing in wine. Yeah. Can't we have one discussion about whiskey without bringing in wine? Yeah. So, yeah. So, the, I, so, I, look, it, so Petrae also brings a little bit more spice as yep. well. Uh, a lot yeah. more intense spice than a lot of the other casts as well. Yep. No, yeah, it does. And then for some reason, the Petraea that's growing in Hungary, I mean, not for some reason, we know why. The Petraea that's going, growing in Hungary is in poor soils, um, higher altitude, slightly colder climate, a um, little less rainfall. And then the Petraea that we get um, from France is healthier, richer soils, loamier soils, more rainfall, a wetter, more humic, like humus environment. And so because of that, we get more tannin um, out of those. And then yeah, kind of more earthy tannin. And then out of the Hungarian oak, the Petraea in Eastern Europe, we get, yeah, spice and um, citrus peel, that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, so we're using three different types of oak. And then we also have, we don't, you know, we're not, we couldn't stop ourselves at just char number three or char number four. We've got a dozen or more, yeah, at least a dozen toast profiles that are unique, customized toast profiles holding the barrel during toasting at specific temperatures for specific durations, and then a char on top of that. So we have that across three oak species. And every time we dump, uh, for the most part, every time we dump those barrels, we fill them with malt or we fill them with corn and we use them again. So that second use is going to be not like the first use. It's going to be a little bit more subtle, a lot less oak character, but still going to offer some wood sugar and interest and structure and kind of verve to the spirit. So yeah, we have a ton of used barrels in our warehouse, our own used barrels, but we don't stop there. We've also got Buffalo Trace, Four Roses, Wild Turkey, um, used, used bourbon barrels, um, George Dickel, Heaven Hill, Old Forester, you name it. We probably have put something in it. And we use those for marrying vessels when we think that, you know, Texas can be quite harsh. And so when we think that something has extracted enough wood and extracted enough wood sugar and character, we drop the proof and transfer it to use bourbon barrel to kind of let it just marry and integrate and oxidize without taking on any new tannin or character or oak character. Um, and we're, con we're constantly kind of playing, you know, we go through a blend and we're looking at hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of samples. Um, this last blend, we were doing single malt. We had 600 samples out a hundred plus went into the blend and then we pulled a hundred plus to have water added to them and be moved to different barrels. And that's just, 
that's just kind of a part of it. Wow. So is that separate? So I just had Emma on from yeah. the Crowded Barrel. Yeah. And like I was, so was she there as part of that or a master class or? No, she was, uh, yeah, Emma, um, we, it was really nice to get to know her. She was up here helping us blend Mirador. Um, we had a ton of uh, samples out from Mirador. We had a little over 300 uh, refill malt samples out. And she was kind of just honed in on used bourbon for three days with us and helped us grade that and sort stuff out. Um, yeah, we do, for some of our like more delicate products and our special releases, we do some really intense grading where we'll have every sample out and we'll nose and taste through every sample and grade it and sort it and categorize it. And then we'll make up little batches from each of those categories and kind of assess those groups. Um, and Jared and I, Jared and I were just doing that today. Still, we're still working on Mirador. Emma's help was invaluable, but we're still kind of, we're still kicking away at it and trying different things. So I'm kind of curious. I think so for my education, I want, there's, there's book knowledge, there's theoretical, and then there's practical, sure. you know, the, the hands-on. And what I'm really looking at for the next couple of years is getting hands-on. I've been trying to get into the spring bank school where you spend a week working at the distillery. Um, so I'd like to get hands on do that, but also then blending as well. Yeah. So I'm guessing, I'm theorizing if you do it completely different, let me know. So with champagne, for example, you have a house style and you blend vintages to achieve a house style of, yeah. of your, of your champagne. Um, do you say, you know, the Bruharia say, this is our classic Bruharia, and future bottlings are going to try to meet this profile. And so we're always going to have the standard and everything. We'll go back to this as sort of the standard. Is yeah. that how we're Bruharia? Or yeah. you're going to vintage your bottling differences that are not trying to maintain the same profile, but trying to be different from year to year? Yeah. No, um, in the core product, in our malt, and then um, Baby Blue and Rye 100, True Blue 100, Brimstone, all of those we're really trying to be, that's going to a lot of places and a lot of people are kind of expecting, hey, I bought this last time, I'm mixing this in a cocktail for my bar or I'm taking it home and having it on ice. And we, you know, we, we try to be pretty, we try to be very consistent and we're consistently throughout the blending process, setting our palette back to the like four or five bottlings we've done before. Um, but with special releases, we try, we do try to achieve like something that we believe is like a similar expression, but we try not to like kind of kill ourselves a little bit and say right. like, oh, well, brewery, it tasted like this last time. So it has to taste that way. And like the finish just isn't there. And the, the noses are totally different with totally different fruit and broncio flavors. We'll just be like, Hey, you know what? Like last time was different Oloroso and different Pedro Jimenez from different bodegas. And, you know, like, what do we want from ourselves? So we do, we do see it as like a little bit of a benchmark, but then it's always a discussion about like, well, it's okay for it to kind of lean this way. It's a little bit more um, spicy on the finish, or this time it's a little bit more fruit forward. And last time it was a little bit more leathery, but that's right. okay because we still believe that it exemplifies something that we want it to exemplify. Right. So um, it, it's Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Yep. So in a sense, because, I mean, you're going to be using different PX casts, different Oloroso casts, perhaps even coming from different bodegas. Yeah. Um, so even the character of the Sherry cast is going to be different as, as well. Yeah. Everything else. So it's, it'll still have that, you know, sort of a classic. Uh, I, I think this is like a Glendronic on steroids. Yeah. No, thank you. That's We love Glendronic. So that is very flattering. We're huge fans. Um, that's one, Glendronic is one of Jared's absolute favorite, uh, yeah. calories. Um, so when I, put it, when I put it on water, I, I uh, and get some, I'm going to pour some. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. So when I put some on water, uh, I put some on water and I taste it and I, you know, I kind of, you know, do the wrist, you know, curl to get some in there. But uh, what I then did is put some water in it and then let us sit in it for three hours. Yeah. And it really became much more integrated. The water did. Um, so this is, and I, 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 I'm estimate, I probably brought it down around 50, 55 ABV somewhere around that. And then when I had tried it and I was just absolutely loving it, but I always say to myself, 
if I was being blinded, what would I think it is? Oh, sure, yeah. Absolutely, hands down, I would have thought it was, you know, uh, a scotch. Ab yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, now, something kind of like full maturation, Glendronic in, in Oloroso or PX. Right, 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 right. So thus far, between these three, this was my favorite, but these other two, you know, they're, they're you know, really, 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 really close, but I absolutely love this one. Yeah, so we I, brought, I brought home two of the Hechiceros, Ooh. and now I'm hoping next on my next trip I can grab another Berharia. Yeah, I have a feeling this one be You can still find that edition of Brujeria floating around somewhere. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, Brujeria is phenomenal. It's really, I, and, and I can, I'm saying that as someone who I actually wasn't, I was around when this was being blended, but I wasn't quite high enough on the totem pole to like have a say and really right. be involved in this. I was on the periphery. Right. Um, but uh, Jared, our head stiller, and Zach Pilgrim, formerly our blender who passed away. Yeah, uh, I remember that. Yeah, Mar uh, almost a year ago in, in March. Right. They both worked like very hard on Brujeria and Echiceros. They spent uh, they spent months. They spent like eight to twelve weeks on these, um, trying. They had a bunch of samples out, and they just tried every combination that they could possibly think of, and and possibly wanted to explore. Um, and I, get, I have some fun facts up about, about Brujeria um, that I, I pulled up uh, in our system that uh, one of the interesting things about it is that we actually squirreled away one peated barrel in it. Oh. So there's one um, uh, peated golden promise barrel in there. Our, our barley that we use is uh, we use 100% golden promise in our, in our um, single malts. So um, in this, there's a wee bit of peat? Yeah, there's one. So yeah, there are I'm looking at this. There are 15 barrels in this, and one of them is a uh, peated golden promise. Okay. Yeah, I didn't detect it, but it's yeah. I mean, so, but even in the in a lot of Highland scotches, will have just you made know, three ppm or just a just a teeny weeny weeny bit, and sure. they're using Highland peat rather than say you know Isla peat or something like that. Um, but a lot of them do have just a little bit of peat uh, going in there. But unless someone tells you, you, it, you don't necessarily recognize it. Yeah, I think the I think the cherry finish kind of helps mask it a little bit it's reading is like smoky leather and it's reading is like this kind of smoky roncio like earthy flavor and so you're thinking right. oh that's cherry but it actually is peat interesting um, <laughs> another thing about this one is that and this is maybe a little bit <clears throat> more revealing than we should be is that sometimes we don't when we'll do an expression like this for this one we had 15 barrels and we're looking at it we have one uh there's like Five or six, there's five Oloroso. No, no, no. Three Oloroso and two Pedro Jimenez. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll move juice through those barrels and then we'll transfer them to use bourbon. And then we'll move more juice through those barrels and let them sit there. And we'll get one, two, at least three, four, maybe four uses out of our sherry because one spirit, you know, one, one, um, one transfer through that it's really, it's really not, it's going to not hold up to it that well if you just let it stay in there for a really long time and take on all the sherry. And so we kind of like try to spread some of the sherry out and make blending a little bit easier. So because of that, it's not 15 barrels that were first time into used Oloroso. So, so in other words, um, rather than putting the spirit in it and just sits there and soaks it up, yeah, instead of passing them through and so rather than having this big, intense and share thing, rather it's a little bit less, but you have a lot more, yes. and then you can get the profile you want because you have a lot more samples. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of work, man. It does. <laughs> and yeah. then and then a, a lot of more samples that us have less immediate or, or less time in contact, yeah. but then you have a number of different variations, and now you're blending them to get the profile that you want. Yeah, exactly. And so the one wow. big one that we moved through there initially, maybe that one was so big that we end up excluding that, but we use the second and third transfers through and it's a softer or like approach to the wine finish. Um, wow. And we did that in Echiceros as well. Echiceros was, I know we're on Bavaria, but Echiceros was 22 barrels and we only had four port barrels. So okay. we, and that's why I think I watched your Echiceros video. I cheated a little bit, but I, 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 I remember you commenting on how sometimes port can overpower. Right. And I, agree. I think sometimes like uh, if, you know, if you have a blend that's every barrel went 
uh, its first time went into a, a first use uh, port barrel, then you can get like really big oxidized red fruit flavors and it can be a little too sweet and overwhelming. Right. So we often do that. We just want to give on that one, we wanted to just give the impression of it and less like this really bold, big kind of effect. So anyways, wow. that's one of the little, that's one of the little tricks that, that uh, we do around here where we get a sherry barrel and it's not like, okay, we're going to use that once. And then it's spent. It's like, no, like we're going to use that four times and we'll have this huge palette on which to draw from and paint from um, the, the expression that we want. So on a, you say on a, on a quick sort of go through, how much time are you talking? Talking a day, an hour? Oh, no, no, no. I'm talk, we're talking months. We're talking like okay. the first round, maybe two, three months. We kind of check it maybe every month just to make sure that it's not really going, getting away from us and getting too much of it. And then the second round will be like, yeah, maybe six months. And then the next round will be, yeah, maybe another four, five, six months. And it's just to kind of stretch out that wine finish and uh, across a wider, um, across more volume, more spirit volume. So I'm thinking in terms of, you know, of course, it, the big conversation we always we keep going back to is the climate, yeah. Of Texas. Yeah. Um, do you think you're able to sort of get feedback from the casks in such a short period of time because of Texas, but also be able to quickly make adjustments yeah. And make decisions because you do get immediate feedback because yeah. of the maturation rate. Yeah, it's a double edged it's a double edged sword where we put something in in a cast like this, in a wine finished cast, particularly the sherry or Madeira or port, and it's gonna pick up a lot really fast. And that is really awesome, but we can very easily over extract till yeah. I mean to the point where some barrels we probably won't ever be able to use in Brujeria because they were the first round through and anytime we use them in an upcoming blend, they're just going to totally wash out and overpower it. Um, so yeah, no, it definitely is. It's a, you know, we try to work with our climate. We don't temperature control our warehouses. Um, we don't try to make whiskey like we're not in the state and the location that we're in. We, we right. do try to kind of tip our hat to that, but it comes with its challenges. And, and so some of that is adding water and knowing when to kind of proof down um, and some of that is just being really mindful. It's like, okay, we just got these. We're not going to ship them off site because we have uh, off site barrel storage, but we also have about 20% on site. So, stuff like this, we'll keep on site so we can check every month and kind of keep our eyes on it. Um, and yeah, Jared and I, we have a bunch of stuff in Madeira right now. We have an upcoming Madeira release um, okay. this year. And um, yeah, we, we, you know, every month we just go and we taste through all of our Madeira barrels just to see, okay, that one's a little underdeveloped. That one's right on. We got it next, maybe next month we think about transferring that to use bourbon and letting it just ride out until the other ones are ready. But yeah, it's, it's really, it's really just being mindful of what you have um, and finding the time to do that kind of stuff. Cause we have right. so many barrels that it's kind of, it feels ridiculous sometimes to like, we're going to go taste five barrels when we need to blend, you know, a hun over a hundred this week. Wow. That is so which brings I, I, every answer I get, I, get, I have more questions. So, one, I find myself that I so uh, for example, I just went to the Institute of Master Wine Bordeaux tasting. There were six, cool. there's sixty chateau there. Um, it's it's there's about a hundred people there. It's mostly uh, it's a lot of sommeliers, uh, masters of wine, or master wine students there. Cool. Um, and but with sixty, and we're talking wine, thirteen five to. 14, 14, five, maybe. Um, but it, I don't ever try to taste all 60 of them. Uh, oh, yeah. You get palate fatigue. It's just after a while, they all start tasting the same. Um, even though if you're drinking water, even though you're spitting and all this kind of stuff. So I tend to focus on about 10 that are my favorites. And then I do a few extras just to, out of curiosity. Yeah. So what brings my mind then in mentioning that is I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and having to taste all these. I'm like, I would, I think I would be quickly, particularly, you're not doing a lot of heavy peated, say like an Isla, but yeah. I, I think I would pr pretty quickly go, okay, I'm spent. You know yeah. what I mean? I would quickly get burned out and I wouldn't be able to uh, qualitatively uh, perceive differences anymore. Yeah. No, I mean, it definitely happens. We You get palate fatigue in your mouth. Um much sooner than you do in like your olfactory senses, your nose, because your nose isn't like, 
you know, you're not dabbing, you know, a Q-tip of whiskey up on your nose. So it kind of its membranes pretty fast. Right. But yeah, I mean, to be perfectly honest, when I first got into the blending side of things, we used to hit it pretty, pretty hard. Um, and we'd taste stuff at cask and we kind of, it was just the job and we wanted to, you know, you want to perceive what this whiskey is. And so maybe you can get through 30, 40, 50 whiskeys in a day. And then you've got a headache and you need to, you know, eat a handful of oyster crackers and take a lift home or something. Right, right, right. Slowly kind of changed a little bit of that. Um, we did some WSCT training, Wine Spirit Education WSCT. Trust. I have a and diploma. I have a diploma from the WSCT. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. that's, like, that's very upper level, man. That's awesome. And, I, and these, and these guys, the, my viewers have no idea what that is. What that yeah, is. That, that, that's awesome. That is not an easy uh, thing to obtain. So yeah, good that's, it's sort of like it's the step below a master of a master of wine. That, that was on my next my next agenda was to go. In fact, one of the units is on spirits. So it's it's production, business, table wines, sparkling wines, fortified wines, and spirits. And as well, studying for the spirits exam, I got introduced to whiskey. Which boom, yeah, uh, I went up there. Yeah, so, so you know this with the WSCT on the spirit end of things. Um, they recommend that as you're tasting, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, a, a $12 vodka or if it's a $150 cognac or, or, or uh, scotch, they recommend proofing down almost half. With yeah. And, and that, I mean, I think that was illustrative for us to realize like, okay, like we're not sacrificing quality by like kind of taking a little easy. Uh, we started, we, we've started spitting a little bit more. So if we're like in the final stages and we are selecting a blend and we've got, you know, a mock-up of five blind uh, blends in front of us and we're trying to pick it, obviously we sit and we're, we're swallowing to, to observe the finish and to kind of yeah. observe how it goes yeah. to the whole palate and the whole experience. Yeah. But if I'm grading 150 samples in a day, now it's like, there's no way in hell I'm swallowing all of these. Right. right. I'd like to have an evening, you know, I'd like right. to right. myself later. Now the, funny, now, the funny thing is, I know most of my viewers, I know exactly what they're thinking. They're all saying, oh, what a hard job. Oh, that's the life. But the reality is, yeah, burnout, I imagine burnout could very much be um, a, a, a risk or a challenge. So when I was, when you're preparing for exams, yeah, you're tasting, 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 because you're going to do things blind, yeah. I was getting burnout just and I'm not wasn't doing it for you know eight, six to eight hours, um, but from tasting, 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 prepare for exams, I would quickly get. I would start feeling burnt out. I feel like I wouldn't be in, in the mood for it. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so but I would imagine you know yes, it's great. Yes, you love your job, yeah. but it requires focus. It's not it's not a party. You know, yeah. you really got to focus on what you're doing. It's an art and a craft, and you have to be mindful of your own senses, and you and you don't want to lose your sense perception of quality because then you're not doing yourself any good yeah. and even if you're spinning you still uh, absorb, particularly sublingual underneath your tongue yeah uh, it, it can go straight into your blood bypassing your liver fun time yeah and <laughs> man th and that'll boom, that'll put you out really 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 quick yeah. so there's a there's a lot of technique and so discipline is the word i'm looking for yeah Discipline yeah. and being focused in what you're doing. Yeah, we don't, you know, we, we don't, you know, I say that we learn from WSCT to proof in half. We actually don't do that. We use, um, I'll actually grab one. We use syringes. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll use uh, uh, micro pipettes. Okay. And so basically we can take, you know, if baby blue rolls up and we're blending baby blue, which is released at, at in bottles, 46% ABV. But all the samples we have in front of us are 62.5% ABV. So there's no reason why we should be drinking something at cast that's going to be bottled at 40 Right, right, right. We have a pet and we can, we can crunch our numbers to say, okay, if I take, for example, seven mils of the spirit in the vial and add 1.8 mils of water, then that's from cast to bottling proof. And so we'll do a lot of that. And then we're spitting on top of that. But I, I mean, I totally get the sentiment because I was like that too. I get the like, oh man, everyone who comes in for tours here, whenever they come into the lending room where my office is, they're like, man, must be a hard job. And it's like, yeah, it is great, but it's also really trying. And it's less like, it's less like, oh, I'm going to leave work with a headache or I'm going to leave work like feeling pretty crappy. But it, it, it's really like, if I burn myself out today, 
And like, what about tomorrow? And I have to work all week, you know? And yeah. so it, it's kind of like, it's, it's like gaffage when they yeah. like force feed a goose uh, to get its liver extra fat. Oh, right, like, right, right, that, right. Goose, that goose likes to eat, but it doesn't, it's a lot less fun when there's like a tube down its throat. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, 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 right. Making pate, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> but I would say for the education alone, that would that is something I would I could I could do for a week, a month maybe, but just for the for the education of the experience of it. Because the more you learn, even if you're not going to do something professionally, yeah. If you play the musical instrument, even if you're not that great at it, and you maybe don't play that much, yeah. But at least if you have a little bit of experience in it, then someone who does it really really well, I think you have a great appreciation of it because you know what it takes to become that great a musician or an athlete or a winemaker, or a, a whiskey producer, you yeah. have a great appreciation for it, which is why I want to get beyond theoretical knowledge and getting yeah. to more practical knowledge, sure. uh, learning about whiskeys, both in the production um, and in blending and, and so forth. Sure. Yeah. And and we're not the pinnacle too. I mean, we're, no. we, we don't think we are. Like we look at, we look at huge producers in Scotland uh, and we look at guys in Kentucky and we're just like, man, like how do they do it at that scale? Like, the level of consistency and quality control and blending and just knowing your process. We know our process, but as we scale, we have to adapt to the new size. But yeah, I mean, it's as we change and as our scale changes, our process change, right. our, pro our processes have to change. And, and uh, we, we're, we're already, we're already doing that a little bit. We're, we have really big blends and we have uh, really big releases that we have to do. And we're hitting the point now this year where, yeah, we can't, we can't drink every sample. You know, we have, We've got a week to crank out a blend. We get six, seven hundred samples. There ain't enough people in the building to sip through all those, you know, to like analyze all of them and to. Um, so we're having to develop systems to how to adapt to the new scale. But it's it's very it's yeah, it's working. So one of the things that the winemakers do, um, and sort of understanding their own wine, their own terroir, and so forth, is they look at the it's say California because that's where I'm at is they're going to look at their counterparts in the old world. So if you're producing Pinot Noir, you, your, your counterpart is going to be Burgundy. If you're producing Cabernet or Cabernet Blend, you, your counterpart is, is Bordeaux and so forth. Yeah. And so you, you have to always be tasting and sampling, uh, particularly if it's of the same vintage, your counterpart in the, in the old world or even other new world, Australia, Chile, or something like that, New Zealand. Yeah. Um, so for you, and I know... Sometimes I know Daniel Whittington says this, you know, tasting, doing whiskey videos, and he doesn't go home and drink whiskey. No but way. Never, so in order to sort of maintain a perspective of the old world counterparts, do you spend any time, you know, tasting other whiskeys from around the world and sort of, yeah. sort of back and forth on that and comparing yeah. them? Yeah, no. Um, I mean, I got into it with bourbon, and but now I think for our malts, obviously – uh, a, a closer analog is is, um, is single malts from the UK, um, but Jared kind of got into whiskey with Scotch, and so he he's been a member of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, the SMWS, for a really long time. We're actually, I think, our second release with them is coming up on Wednesday. We have an event at the distillery for that, um, but we 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 drink a lot of that. We drink a lot of Scotch, um, and that is. I, it, it sounds snooty, but you know we use a Scottish barley, and um, that's grown and, and malted over there. And we use Scottish stills, and our mash tun is from Scotland, and our yeast, our Scottish yeast. And so, like a lot, Texas is our, our climate affects a, a lot of what we do, and a lot of our barrels are obviously not from the UK; they're from they're from here, and they're from um, Eastern Euro Europe and, and France. But yeah, a lot of our stuff, for for all intents and purposes, the closest analog for us is like okay, well. Can we get any three, four, five year old Glen Farkles, you know, or Glen or, or, or Glendronic or whatever? And so um, we do try to immerse ourselves in that world because that's more kind of what we're, we're going for with our own kind of riff on it. Right. But with a, so with a Texas twist. Yeah, yeah, with a Texas twist. And that's unavoidable just because it's our climate. And, and we never, I don't think anyone at Balcones got into this to be like, oh, we want to make, we want to make something that tastes like, a single malt from the UK or from Scotland. That wasn't the plan. It was just like, Hey, like that's a tradition that we think we can find ourselves like setting and forging a new path in. And we right. use 
stills and we use that kind of barley. Um, you like your forefathers. Yeah. Yeah. No, a little bit, a little bit. And, and yeah, so the, cl and the closest, um, when we have a problem or when, when we have a question, you know, we're, we're opening up a, a Scottish a whiskey book, you know, like a, a textbook from over there, or we're contacting the people who built our stills and our equipment overseas and asking them, Hey, like we're having this issue. What do y'all do? It's not a call to Kentucky or Indiana, you know, right. um, you know, I pot stills. So um, I'm absolutely loving these whiskeys. And what I'm hoping for that the Texas Whiskey Association will be able to do. Yeah. I know a lot of distilleries, they're not big enough to have a wide distribution. Even if the laws were different, they don't have the supply to go out there. Yeah. But we're hoping that the laws will change. At least people could do direct order uh, from a distillery in order to have a ship to California or wherever else. Um, I fly, I, me, I find myself getting on an airplane, flying somewhere and bring, and bringing them, bringing them home. Yeah. Um, so, so for those who are going, I'm trying to encourage people to do whiskey tourism. Yeah. I know it's expensive. It takes time. People got kids and everything else, but go to Scotland, go to Kentucky mm -hmm. and go to Texas. If yeah. you can, if you make a holiday out of it, um, have you got anything coming down the pike that yeah. if someone's planning a trip down to, uh, Balcones that they should have an, an eye open for, uh, to yeah. this. I mean, these are fantastic, but what, you got anything else coming out as well? Oh, yeah, no. Um, yeah, on the, on the malt end of things, uh, which is kind of what we're talking about, those are all malts that we're looking at. Um, yeah, we've got some big stuff coming. We're actually uh, we're doing uh, kind of like a, a little bit of a release in homage to Zach Pilgrim, um, and that'll be that probably won't come up um, until maybe later in the summer or in the fall. A lot of our malt releases are kind of getting pushed towards the fall. Um, and a lot of that is going to be peated. So we have Ooh. a lot of stuff um, that's coming out that's going to be refill peated. So our 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 um, peated releases that are out on the market now, the one that we did in 2018 and the one that we did last year, those are all 100% peated Golden Promise in new oak, new American oak. And but we've been holding on to this stuff peated, the same juice, the the same peated uh, Golden Promise that we put into use uh, bourbon predominantly La Trace of Four Roses. And so that stuff is kind of coming into its own. We've been finishing it in Sotern, and Ooh. it is quite, quite good. Uh, so we're, we're really excited about that. And that's kind of the next big malt thing for us is to do that. We'll have some, uh, a, a unique Madeira finished expression that comes later in the year. And then we're going to do that Sotern, the peated Sotern expressions that'll come later in the year. Um, but there's a lot more. Yeah. For the viewers, Sotern is a, uh, sweet botrytized wine from the Gra uh, lower Grav region of left bank of Bordeaux, uh, but it's very, 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 very sweet. A lot of honey, yeah. uh, a lot of floral notes. Uh, so really, really sweet type of wine. So using a Saturn cask, and then Madeira is uh, a fortified wine from the uh, Port uh, Portugal island. Yeah. Um, do you happen to know? Because there's like four different types of Madeira. There's uh, Cercial. Uh, yeah, Vigano, Boal yeah. and Malmsey. Would you happen to know which one of those you might be using? Well, one thing about that collab is like we're actually doing it with um, uh, Hack Winery, which is a uh, winery south of Houston in Texas, and so it's a Texas Madeira. Um, oh. Actually, it's a winery that's been a, that's been established for quite some time. They're pretty reputable, and they make they kind of focus on dessert wines. They do ports in Madeira, okay. and they actually do like kind of a traditional Madeira. They do I can't remember the word because I don't know my Portuguese is awful. It's like Estum. Estum Estumfaba, they like they like cook the barrels, so they actually have like an oven that they put their Madeira. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. It, so, so Madeira traditionally it was put on a ship. Yeah, it's making its way to the uh, to the UK, and it's we're getting rocked on the ship, and it's getting heated up, mm -hmm. and it would develop this profile um, from going from Madeira to the UK. Well, now to imitate that, they put it in a heated room, sort of like in an attic yep. called the Stufa. Yeah. And so that's where it gets heated. So yep. there are a few wineries. I actually learned about this because um, Andalusia is using them as well. Uh, oh, so there are a few uh, wineries. Oh, yeah, Andalusia got the same barrels as us. Yeah. Who can use the name Madeira? But that's because they were grandfathered in. If you yep. start a winery now, you can't call anything Madeira because it's a protected. Uh, um, AOC, but anyway, uh, yeah. so but that's been, really interesting. I'm interested to see what uh, what comes out of that. 
Yeah, no, it'll be really neat. So we're doing that and, and, and some other things too. So yeah, we'll have, a, we'll have a big release in April that I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about. Um, but it's very big. It's a very big uh, collab that we're doing. And that's going to drop in April. And that's going to be a pretty affordable, approachable product that's going to be geared more towards um, like uh, bourbon style. Uh, okay. Um, and we're, we're pretty excited about that. And, um, so yeah, no, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff coming up. We're do, we have a huge event, um, this coming Saturday, we're hosting the Texas, uh, whiskey, Texas, Oklahoma whiskey club summit. So okay. we're in whiskey clubs from all the major metropolitan areas. Um, and also Tulsa to the distillery and we're doing, a um, a barrel pick. And so people are going to come and they're going to vote on six barrels and then we're going to bottle three of them and they're going to be able to buy them that day. We're doing raffles of um, some of our 10 year anniversary stuff and some of our five year anniversary stuff that we have on our vault. Um, so yeah, no, we, we got, we got a lot of fun stuff cooking. If you want to, if you could uh, follow us on um, uh, Instagram at Balcones Distilling, um, you can kind of keep, keep track of upcoming releases and also like bigger events that we do. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah I hate to fly. I hate oh. flying. But I, I, you know, I wish I could get out to the Texas more often and be more involved. But I am enjoying the time I'm spending down there. And I want to recommend. Hey, I want to thank you for coming on. This we're hitting just at the hour mark. This has been absolutely fantastic. I can promise you, you're here for another hour. Perhaps I'll have you on again. I'm yeah. sure I'm going to do another Texas series uh, next year uh, because I'll be returning in June and July and October of this year. So I'm hoping to finish the whiskey trail this year. I'll be picking up more bottles. Definitely be uh, in your neighborhood, so I'll drop by again. And meet up with my again. We'll hook you up for sure. And um, are you going to the Bastards Ball? Uh, absolutely. Oh yeah, I was there this last year. Absolutely. absolutely. I saw you there. I was there too. That's right. Okay. I don't remember. It's all blur. I don't yeah. There's too much whiskey. It's a river of whiskey. And there's a lot of guys there with beards. <laughs> well, thanks for having me on. It was really fun. Yeah, it's been absolutely fantastic. So. Hey, uh, I want to thank everyone for watching the premiere or watching on the replay. If you haven't subscribed already, please do. And give this video a thumbs up. And uh, share it with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, and other social networking channels. Until next time, hey, cheers, man. Cheerio. Thank you. Hey, don't forget to subscribe and check out these other whiskey videos.